So today we are going to talk about a new strategy that NSF put in place in his endeavor to contribute to elimination of plasmodium falciparum in an area of multidrug and artemisinin resistance in Cambodia. Cambodia is a part of the Greater Mekong subregion together with Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar, plus the Chinese province of Yunnan, where ACT, artemisinin combination therapy, a cornerstone of malaria uh, treatment, uh, in particular um, for plasmodium falciparum, are failing to a different degree. In particular in Cambodia, four out of the five validated WHO ACT are experiencing high treatment failure rate, more than 10%, which is the threshold put uh, by, set by WHO to shift, uh, to change ACT. And um, this is, uh, phenomenon is driven by artemisinin resistance, uh, that is a public health threat because if artemisinin resistance spread from the Greater Mekong subregion to Africa, then it will cause, like in the past, chloroquine resistance and sulfadoxine pyrimetamine resistance, uh, mortality among, in particular, the high risk population, children under five pregnant women. That's why we, um, together with all the major stakeholders in malaria, agreed on the, the principle that the most important strategy to uh, stop and prevent and avert the spread of artemisinin resistance is through elimination of plasmodium falciparum that is set by 2025 in the Greater Mekong subregion and by 2020 in Cambodia. And uh, that's where we are today in uh, the north province of uh, Preavir in the district of Chaisan in Cambodia, working uh, in particular in this district with uh, 23,000 inhabitants spread across 27 villages served by 28 village malaria workers. These village malaria workers are people from the community trained to use the rapid diagnostic test to interpret and to provide the first line treatment uh, that is indeed today artesunate mefloquin. But uh, in 2016, in particular in January 2016, the previous ACT that was Didro artemisinin piperakin, because of the high treatment failure rate, was a shift, was a change indeed to this artesunate mefloquin. The main strategy of MSF lies on the main th three main axes, the passive case detection, the reactive case detection, and what we will talk more extensively today in this second part of the presentation, that is the proactive case detection. The passive case detection basically uh, means that uh, symptomatic cases uh, need to timely get access to a quality um, network of test provider, supported, trained by MSF, and empowered by the use of PCR that is much more sensitive than RDT. Then, because we work in a context of multidrug resistance, it's important as well to uh, check uh, 28 days after the treatment if the parasite is still present in the blood. So with this data, we can evaluate the um, PCR-based parasitological treatment failure. And finally, in collaboration with Pasteur Institute in Cambodia, we analyze the DNA of the parasite to check for two genes in particular, the mutation of these genes. One is uh, so-called K13. It's called K13 because mapped on the chrom chromosome 13 of the uh, plasmonium parasite, uh, falciparum. And uh, the gene PFMDR1, which stands for plasmodium falciparum mefloquine drug resistance, which is very important because today we are using artesunate mefloquine. So uh, it has been seen that the amplification of this gene, PFMDR1, is associated with uh, mefloquine resistance. We will see later. Um, reactive case detection is uh, basically a screening around the, ca uh, the case, PF cases that we identified through the uh, passive case detection. We will not talk today about this because uh, we don't have uh, indeed the time. While we will talk more extensively about this proactive case detection, which is a, a new strategy, is a paradigm shift, is not anymore the symptomatic person going to the uh, network or test provider, but it is the test provider going toward asymptomatic people that are considered a high risk group harboring the parasite. And then in this way, we want to decrease the so called human parasite reservoir that is thought to be uh, the main maintaining the endemicity of malaria. So we, see, we have said um, before that uh, indeed uh, till uh, January 2016, we used the hydroartemisinin in piperakin. We see here from October 2015, uh, when we started collaboration with Pasteur Institute uh, till uh, January 2016, that we identified, we diagnosed 130 PF cases, uh, and we treated them with this drug. And then uh, 39 of them were still positive in day 28. So the 
uh, PCR-based parasitological treatment failure was a 30%, well above the 10% that we mentioned before. Uh, so we had to change, the, uh, indeed, the ACT. At the national level, this was done in February 2016. And today we can say that, uh, luckily, after more than one year, artesunate mefloquine is still uh, efficacious uh, very much because uh, out of 50 cases treated with uh, artesunate mefloquine, zero cases are positive in day 28. At the same time, we check for the DNA for the mutation of the K13 that is associated with artemisinin resistance. And out of around 200 PF cases, 80% of these cases were carrying the mutation of K13. So artemisinin resistance is very much widespread in the district where we work. And we analyze as well the PFMDR1 for the amplification of this gene. In the two treatment group, in the treatment group of the didroartemisinin piperacine, only 9% of the PF were uh, indeed uh, carry an amplification of this gene, while in the treatment group of artesunate mefloquine, almost 50%. So there was a huge increase from 9% to 50% of this amplification. In uh, summary for this uh, first part of the presentation, we can say that in this widespread uh, artemisinin resistant contest, uh, didro artemisinin piperacine is not anymore effective while art artesunate mefloquine is very much effective, but the presence of this increase in the uh, proportion of the PF cases with an amplification of the PFMDR1 is worrisome because it could anticipate a clinical resurgence of mefloquine in the area where we work. So we are very much in a, a situation of uh, uh, difficulty in terms of uh, uh, treatment, and uh, therefore it's important to find a new strategy to identify as many as possible and uh, as early as possible PF cases in order to decrease the so-called human parasite reservoir. We did tr this uh, through, indeed, uh, a voluntary screening treatment by trying to mobilize high people at risk, in particular people spending time in the forest, in the plantation, in the rice field, and the people with past history of malaria. Open question of this uh, study that was a mixed study, in particular for the quantitative study, the open question were revolving at around the three issues, the issue of feasibility, and then as well uh, the issue of uh, yield, extra yield of PF cases uh, by proactive case detection compared to the passive case detection. And finally as well, to better profile the population at risk. In summary here, we can see the um, strategy, the outline of the activity. In the center, we have the village with the people moving from the village to the forest, to the plantation, to the rice field, spending in time in those locations. In step number one, we see that uh, there is a mobilization uh, through health promotion messages revolving around, in particular, the concept of asymptomatic malaria to try to mobilize the people at risk. In step number two, we indeed test the people with RDT and PCR for free no age restriction criteria. And then, as well, in step number three, feasibility-wise, we want to treat the people that are positive in PCR in particular uh, within 14 days um, from the testing day. We treat them with tidro artemisinin piperacine, and then in day 28, we will check the PCR-based parasitological treatment failure. Some result, out of 3,000 tests, 3,075, done in this pilot between December 2015 and March 2016 in three villages, because indeed the three villages were our target uh, area of intervention, we identified 33 PF cases for a detection rate of 1.1%. Uh, 33 cases, cases were as double as the 17 cases that we identified in the same period in the same villages with the passive case detection activity. Uh, Feasibility-wise, we were able to treat um, all of these cases, except one, uh, within on average 13 days. Out of these uh, 33 cases, 24 were uh, male and uh, 9 were female. And the age uh, category that was uh, most um, high in terms of uh, detection rate was in the age category between 15 years and 50 years. Incidentally, as well, the mobilization rate, the coverage rate, was higher in this uh, age category between 15 and 60 years old, mm -hmm. reaching almost a peak of 60% of the total population for this age category tested across uh, the period from December 2015 and March 2016. 
Uh, to better profile the population at risk, we uh, ran a multivariate logistic regression analysis, and we saw that uh, people spending any time in the rice field and having past history of malaria didn't hold any significant risk for PF infection with a P of 0, 05, 0, 06 respectively, while people spending any time in the forest and in the plantation were uh, holding this risk with an odd ratio of 3.4 and 2.3 respectively. Moreover, not shown in this slide, uh, we stratify by gender, we saw that the male spending any time in the forest and uh, women spending any time in the plantation were indeed at risk for PF infection with an odd ratio of four and eight respectively. On summary, we can say that this pilot of proactive detection proved to be feasible and, and detected as well as double as the cases uh, identified by PCD in the same villages in the same period of time and uh, contributed to better profile the population at risk, uh, moving from uh, the simplistic uh, paradigm of uh, male forest goer at risk uh, to a more comprehensive concept of uh, people spending any time in the forest and or in the plantation, uh, regardless of the gender, being at, at high risk of PF infection. I want to thank for this, of course, our colleague international and national in the project of Preavir, in the, the capital Phnom Penh coordination team, in the medical department in Brussels, as well as our friends and colleagues in the Pasteur Institute of Cambodia and the Cambodian National Malaria Center. Thanks. Thank you very much for this excellent talk and for staying in time. Are there any technical questions? A lot. Um, can we start here? You were the first, I think. Um, yeah, Daniel O'Brien from Manson Unit. So I was just interested if you could explain, so the uh, artesianate and mefloquine worked with 100% effectiveness, yet 80% had the K13 gene for resistance to artesianate and uh, nearly 50% had resistance to mefloquine. So presumably a lot of them had both resistance genes. So how does the medication still work in that situation? Um, Today, this, the situation in Cambodia is dramatic because uh, uh, actually out of the five ACT, the only ACT that uh, currently works uh, is artesunate mefloquine, uh, clinically speaking. Of course, we are, we are seeing this uh, genetic-wise uh, increase of uh, um, PF carrying the amplification of uh, um, PF MDR1. So it might be that in the next uh, six months, uh, maybe one year, uh, they will be as well again resistant to mefloquine. Uh, luckily enough, uh, it has been seen that uh, because of these genetic dynamics, when there is uh, uh, a resistant to mefloquine, then uh, the resistant to piperakin uh, wanes away, goes down, uh, because uh, apparently this uh, PFMDR1 um, exert is a kind of a, uh, protein and membrane transportation, then increase the possibility for the piperakin to re-enter in the parasite and then to kill the parasite. But of course, uh, the situation is dramatic. Today we are doing as well uh, in Cambodia therapeutic efficacy study for other ACT like artesuneta modayakin. Uh, results are not yet available, but are not so, um, let's say, uh, positive. Uh, preliminary data. So the situation is dramatic and then uh, we don't have any other drugs in the pipeline for the next four or five years. Another possibility is to do a triple <coughs> combination therapy using uh, artesunate mefloquine, mefloquine and piperakin together. This has been trialed, uh, is under trial with uh, in particular Moru, uh, but um, still that's more or less the uh, up-to-date situation. Uh, I'm afraid we only have one question left. Because we have to go on. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, I apologize for the people in the back. Maybe we can discuss later your questions. Um, Thomas Dennison from MSF OCP. I just have a question with regards to your diagnostic assay, thinking that PCR is probably not going to be a feasible tool in, 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 in rollout of this screening process, whether you thought about the new, more sensitive RDT that I think just have become, I don't know if it's available commercially yet, but um, where the detection limit for the HRP2 uh, <coughs> level is much lower, whether that could replace PCR in such a strategy? Yes, that's a very good point. 
we are showing here a, a model, a template that can be used in the future as well by replacing a PCR with a hypersensitive RDT. Uh, up to today, we can't say more than that, but that's um, po probably and possibly the, the way to follow, yeah. Thank you as very will much. be a point of, point of care, yes.